So let's say you're going to make this uh, shelf bracket, something to hold a shelf up on a wall. So I've got a wall and I've got a proverbial shelf here. And I created some geometry that would be the basis for what I'm going to use in order to generate a design for uh, my shelf bracket. I'll explain a little bit about how this works later. But uh, I've got the whole thing and all I need to do is go into uh, generate to design in Fusion 360. And it brings in all the data that I need. I'll explain what all these bits are in just a moment, but most importantly, I don't really need the wall and I don't really need the shelf. They're very large, and so I replace them using sort of a small L, L bracket. That re represents the space that the wall and the shelf will take up. If I use the shelf and the wall completely, it would take a lot longer to calculate, so just using these small pieces is probably a good idea. The first thing you always need to do with generative design is describe to the system what parts um, you have to have and what parts um, represent obstacles where you have other parts or need some free space. So the first thing I do is I go in here, I say, uh, dear generative design, these uh, two plates here, they are my preserved geometries. That means no matter what you build for me, I need these two places. And that's logical. I have to have one wall attachment and I have to have a place for my shelf to attach to. And um, I think that they would look something like this. I could make them a bit more creative, I'm certain, but I'll need to have those two flat places. Now, what you see here that looks like a hashtag or something like that is actually the space I need for my screws and my bolts. Um, not only the screws and bolts themselves, but I need place to slide them in. So I need to add some extra material. And of course the shelf and the wall itself are also obstacles. I can't have anything growing into there, otherwise they wouldn't really fit. So I describe those as obstacles. See? And you can see what that looks like right there. Now you do that with standard modeling techniques and fusions. Some for some of you it'll be easy, some of it'll be harder, but it doesn't take much practice. Now, just like every sort of simulation, I have to now tell the system something about loads and boundary conditions. And I'm gonna say that the shelf is fixed against the wall at the back. And as a loading, I'm gonna put, uh, I think it was about 500 Newtons uh, pushing down. Now that's perfectly fine, that would be actually enough. But in real life, things have um, multiple loadings quite often. Um, things can be used for uh, things that they were not in in intended for or designed for, and you don't want to have them break immediately in those conditions. So what I can do is I can clone the load conditions, the load cases. So just right click and say clone. And then I get a copy of exactly the, uh, the load condition I had before, which is fixed at the back and with 500 Newtons pushing down. But of course, I don't have 500 Newtons pushing down. I imagine a situation where perhaps somebody would go in there and say, oops, I banged against the uh, edge of the shelf. So I put 225 pushing up, like if somebody stood up underneath the shelf and maybe banged it with their head. And I cloned it again. And then I can say 225 Newtons uh, pushing in one direction to the side. And I'll just go ahead and let you know already I cloned it a last time and I also uh, did 225 Newtons pushing in the other direction. The advantage of cloning is that I don't have to redefine that fixed connection every single time. I can certainly do that, but um, by cloning I save myself a lot of time and effort. So, checking out all those loads, checking them all out. Gravity is insignificant here, but uh, I didn't turn it off, you're certainly welcome to, but the parts are so small that their own weight doesn't have a really f uh, big effect on their um, static um, loading conditions. You'll notice that to swap between each of the load conditions, you can click on this little radio button at the back and that activates each load condition. Um, something that uh, you can do all over in Fusion, people don't always know about. Now you can activate individual parts and components and studies and things like that. The next thing you need to do before you start is uh, tell the system you have some goal in mind and I would like to minimize my mass and I'd like to have a safety factor of one. Uh, that's a probably not really a good idea, but I wanna have nice uh, spindly looking geometry. Now, if you don't know what a safety factor is, you should go look it up, um, but it basically means this part is gonna be built exactly as strong as it needs to be. 
The next thing I just showed right now is the manufacturing criteria. This is unique uh, to generative design because what we do is we can tell the system that these are the machines or the types of machines that I have available to make my shelf bracket. I can do an unrestricted, I can do an additive manufacturing, which is 3D printing, or I could do three axis CNC uh, milling or even five axis. I define a couple criteria there and that lets the system know these are the machines and these are the capabilities I have for manufacturing. The final step is to just go in and define some perspective materials that I'd like to use. Um, I can use up to 10 um, and I can just throw them in there and you'll notice that I chose some that are quite obviously good like a steel or an aluminium they would be quite useful for a shelf bracket I'm putting some other ones in there that are certainly marginal um, maybe a bronze or a brass which would be quite soft you even have some materials in there which certainly wouldn't work like a like glass or something but you can certainly try them and the software will try to fi figure out a way to manufacture this shelf bracket made of chewing gum for instance, if you have the data for chewing gum. Now, one thing I recommend you do, and this was brought into the system after uh, extensive feedback by our customers, is to use the preview. We didn't have it at first, but the preview basically um, does a very simplified calculation and tries to figure out what the geometry will roughly look like that you can expect to see at the end of your calculations. It's not doing actual stress and strain calculations. It's just showing you where your keep out regions are, your obstacles and where your preserves are. And the idea behind it is that quite often we saw in the past that people would forget to put obstacles in and it was naturally, naturally frustrating um, for them to wait um, 20 minutes or maybe a couple hours on a particular um, analysis only to find out that they've forgotten a particular um, keep out. And this costs nothing. Um, it only takes a minute or two. And to be honest, I work at this company and almost every time I do this, I tend to forget at least one keep out. So I do recommend it. So this actually looks pretty good doesn't look like we've forgotten anything shouldn't be it's an example I use quite a bit and uh, I think we're good to go so the next state the next stage of this analysis would just to be say generate it's this button right here generate and it will tell you that um, uh, you need to pay um, 25 cloud credits that is more or less about 25 euros I think it's also more or less 25 dollars and after you do that, it will send up a calculation to Amazon Web Services and it will run thousands and thousands of calculations. And you'll see all these results. This takes about 20 or 30 minutes to see. It's true. But you can see all these results and you can sort of flip through them. You can see how they were made. Are they converged or are they um, completed? Completed is a bit tricky because completed sounds like it's a great idea. Um, what you really want to see though is converged. Completed just means, hey man, I did all my mathematics, I did all the calculations, but I wasn't able to satisfy your criteria. Quite often you'll see this if you use materials that just aren't strong enough um, in order to um, fulfill your needs. You can look at the data in various um, ways to filter and sort and um, check out um, promising designs. The idea behind it is not that the software gives you one uh, super result. Um, many results uh, will work. Um, you will choose them based on cost, time to manufacture, perhaps the aesthetic reasons or whatever, and uh, you can filter and sort uh, in a whole bunch of different ways. Now, if we look at all these results, let's look at one. This is uh, one particular result. It is, a, um, it is an unrestricted version, which means it didn't really take into account any manufacturing criteria. It just said, uh, Mickey, I'm going to give you the best result from the standpoint of um, 
statics. Yeah. And I want to show you how this works. The very first iteration on all these studies is exactly the same. It fills up the entire area that it has to um, that it has at its disposal with material, the material that you defined. And it does a series of stress strain calculations and it figures out which material is being loaded and which material isn't. And over many, many iterations, you only see some of them here, you can see that it basically melts out the material that is not being loaded and leaves material that is being loaded. And this takes a while, but after, in this case, 33 iterations, it came to a really nice, very spindly result, which you can see over on the bottom right actually more than fulfills your um, factor of safety criteria. And if I liked, I could then um, just export this. Now, exporting will cost you 100 cloud credits, but the idea behind this is that you're getting something valuable and you already know what you're going to get because you've been able to check it out. Now, there are some other things that are interesting to look at, uh, especially with regards to the various manufacturing criteria. Let's go in here and I'll look at one that's unrestricted. I'll look at another one that um, was created using um, three axis CNC machining. And I'll use another one that was created using um, additive manufacturing, 3D printing. And you can see some of these are uh, certainly ugly. I don't think I'd want to have my shelf held up by them, but technically they work. They are converged, they are uh, manufacturable, and so the software gives them as a result. It's up to you to decide which one you really like. So we can select several of these at once. I was a bit busy here um, trying to decide which one exactly I wanted to look at. I did take my time. This one looks all right. And we can compare these three results um, side by side. And you can see they're quite different. Um, although they all fulfill my results, uh, my requirements. They all have a minimum safety factor of one or better. This one you can see I have a pull direction, uh, well the machining direction in the Y and the Z, which means I can come from uh, that direction from the Y and from the Z direction. So you can see this thing would be lying on its um, side and the tool would be coming from the top. There are some things to remember, like these bolt holes. You couldn't actually get those with a three axis CNC, but they were part of my preserved geometry. So the software doesn't touch those. We'll need to work on that in the future, but that'll be up to you to know that that doesn't work. This is a additive manufacturing version. It is 3D printed and it is printed from the bottom up um, in the Z direction, I believe, or in the Y direction, yeah. And the Y direction, um, you can sort of see where it's lying on the build plate. And it is quite funky, but this is what a typical um, powder bed uh, 3D printer might be able to do for you. Um, doesn't take into account things like FDM, although you might be well able to do this on an FDM printer, but it's uh, mostly thinking about commercially available powder bed printing, which is um, sort of the professional version. Yeah. So if you like one of these and you've downloaded it, um, it'll take a couple minutes to do. So I did it in advance. And I have one here. Took my time finding it. Got a bunch of data on my machine. And this is the sort of thing you can expect to get. Um, it's very organic and it may be difficult to do today um, without a 3D printer, but we have quite a lot of customers who are using these designs as inspiration and are building other things. Now I hope you did learn something today and hope it was useful and good luck 